Hello and welcome to our sixth tutorial. First thing I want to say is I actually um, I actually made a mistake in the last video. Um, just at the very end, um, it should be cons empty x, not cons x empty like I wrote. Anyway, now that's out of the way, um, let's move on to making the next tutorial. So you can see that I have sat down and made them all in one day. Tutorial six. Um, so. In this tutorial, I th think what we're going to cover is, um, ooh, we're going to cover more type classes. That's it. Um, so functors, applicative, monad, and monoid. Um, so I'm going to do this properly with cable in it. Oops. Um, because we're going to be doing I/O now. Finally, I/O. We can actually build our programs and run them. Um, so let's do that. Um, so first thing to mention, um, I should have loaded the, uh, I should have loaded the REPL actually, um, cause we're not, we're not doing IO yet. We're, we're still a little, little bit away. Um, this tutorial, but a bit of work to cover first. Um, so. Um, ooh, let's start with monoids. They're the, they're the easiest. So there's a class called monoid and its definition is something like this. Um, semi group, uh, M to monoid M where, um, mem Memp T is of type uh, M. Mapend is of type uh, M to M to M. So this is the monoid type class, um, and this is the first properly abstract uh, type class that we've looked at. We've only looked at um, We've only looked at ones that we, they're easy, like number, equality, but this is monoid. And it, it has a dependency on a type class called semigroup. You know, we're, we're, we're digging deep into, into mathematics now. We're not actually. Um, the Haskell compiler writers are, which is why they have all of these deeply mathematical names, but you don't need to worry about really what, what these things mean. Um, now, Mapend, has a default implementation like this. And this infix operator we find in semigroup. We have to define in semigroup. So what is a monoid? So a monoid is a thing, a type, that has a unit type and also has a single binary operator. Um, so lists are of type monoid, and I'll show that in the REPL again. So um, one, two, three, and then that, uh, and you see we have one, two, three, one, two, three. Um, and we're using mapend in the middle. I, I could have written um, mapend. Um, there we go. One, two, three, one, two, three. Now, there are some rules for what makes something a monoid. So if either of um, memp t, if either of the arguments to mapend is memp t, the result has to be the same. Um, as it is in this case, um, because lists are valid monoids. Um, and that's all it really is. Um, if you want to define your own monoid um, instances, you need to define an instance for semigroup, but that's really easy um, because semigroup only has one function and that is the uh, binary operator there. Um, so that's it for monoids. I only really wanted to mention them because um, I wanted to show you that there's there's sort of a higher level of, a higher level of thinking when it comes to uh, when it comes to type classes. Um, so examples of other monoids, um, 
you could probably say that integers can be made into a monoid with uh, mempty being zero and mapend being plus. Um, you could also say that it's uh, a monoid with um, one and multiplication. Uh, lots of things can be monoids. But now for the more interesting, the more uh, and something that you'll actually use a lot. So there is a class um, called functor. Oh, func functor. Um, and this is what we have in functor. Fmap is of type A to B to FA to FB. Now this looks really similar to something we've come across before. If you're thinking that looks like map, you'd be completely right. Um, if I go map plus one, the classic, to one to 10, I've done this many times, we get that answer. If I do fmap, it is exactly the same. fmap is map for, uh, yeah, is map for um, lists. I wonder if this works. Let me capsule F. Hey, now we're getting somewhere. Um, so sometimes you can go colon info um, and then something like, for example, I did functor here. And this is quite useful. Um, so it said the type functor is of, ah, ignore this for quite a few tutorials. But here we have the class definition of functor. So we have fmap, which I showed you. We have these other two things. So this is like, what is this? Ah, you can ignore that. It can derive that. And here it says minimal fmap. And that means that a minimal definition of functor, you only have to give fmap, which is what I was planning to do. And here it shows you some instances. Um, it doesn't show, oh, there, it shows that list is an infinite, uh, is an instance. Um, cool, handy to know. Um, right, so we are going to use fmap. So um, before we made this um, data type called, um, we called it error, but I think failure, failure or, yeah, failure this time seems nicer. Um, we made this in the data type tutorial. So I think that was tutorial three or something. I don't know. Um, you can find it. And we said it was either fail or we said error or okay. A. Um, now let's, I'm going to explain fmap by defining fmap on fail. So let's look at this. So here we have a function. I, I think the best way to think of fmap is to actually put in the implicit brackets in the type. Um, so fmap maps functions to functions. Okay. Um, the category theory, they'd say uh, a functor is a, a morphism that maps morphisms to morphisms. Um, so this is our input function and this is our output function. And you see what it seems to do is it adds this context. Um, and that makes sense. So we, we have sort of the category of functions and the category of functions on lists, and you can see the similarities. Um, so our plus one was of type A to A, and we turned it to list A of list A. And we can do this with all sorts of things. So let's do it with failure. So instance functor of failure A. I'm going to comment this out again because this conflicts with the Haskell definition. Um, where fmap f of uh, OK x equals um, OK f x using that dollar sign again and f map f of uh, fail equals fail. So what have I done? Ah, a kind error. My bad. Um, yeah. 
uh, how do I explain that one? It was expecting a type that took in a parameter. Um, so when I gave it the parameter, I saturated it by accident, and I wasn't meant to. Um, anyway, there we go. I now have fmap defined for uh, failure. So let's let's try it out. So if I go fmap plus one, um, let's look at the type of that. So you see it takes a functor and a number, and it makes the function fb to fb. So fmap plus one of, let's start with fail, is fail. And fmap plus one of OK6, it's going to be OK7. Um, now, this is a really, really, really useful function. Um, what it does is it allows us to write very general functions, um, like plus one, that operates on all numbers. And then we, without having to worry about the context, we can move that function into a context. We can lift it into a context. So I lift this into sort of the erroneous context. I now have a plus one function that is safe. It won't plus one on failed values. It'll only plus one on valid values. Um, so it's very, very handy and it's used a lot. It's often it's used in infix form. Um, so just so you know, my font, it's that, but without the spaces. Um, uh, OK, 6, same value. So, so it's, it can be used in infix form as well. Um, so that's functor. Um, so next, oh, easy now, Vim, bit eager. Next, let's look at another class. And this is um, applicative. So it takes, um, so, so it has a, so all things that are applicative also have to be functors and that is expressed in its definition. Um, so we have two functions this time, pure, which is of type a to fa. And we have this infix function, uh, which is also known as app which is of type um, f a to b to f a to f b. Um, so this, it's a really interesting type class, this. And it's not always obvious what you use it for. So I, I might, it's really fun when things come up, um, but thinking of examples that are quite simple might be difficult. Um, but let's try it out. So, wow, it just, uh, let me compile that. Maybe I spelled applicative wrong. Who knows? I'm going to comment down anyway. So, um, let's play around with pure first. Um, ah, no, no, I need to, uh, give an instance of, um, failure for that. So instance applicative failure. And I can, you know, I can define applicative because I have an instance for monad. So pure is easy enough to define. Um, so I, I just wrap it with an OK. I can, of course, remove these two X's. Um, it's called pointless programming when you program with as little variable inputs as possible. Um, and then this one is always a bit tricky. Um, so we have OK F applied to OK X equals OK uh, F X. And then we have fail applied to anything equals fail. And we have anything applied to fail, which equals fail. So you can see it has very similar error handling properties. Um, 
to uh, yeah, just like F map. So let's think of an example. Okay. Um, somewhere where this is used a lot is um, type constructing. So let me let me think about this. Yeah. So uh, how am I going to do this? Um, let's make a type. Um, let's go data person equals person string int int. I don't know. Maybe that string is their name, their age, and their ID. Um, that will do. Deriving show. So say I had a bunch of computations that um, could fail. Um, and I want to construct something of type person, but uh, any of the computations to get that data could have failed. Maybe they were um, erroneous database accesses. In which case, I could write this code. So person applied to OK, uh, and it was a string. James, I'll do me. Um, and then we have this applicative thing. OK, and then it was age, so 21. And then another applicative thing. Um, OK, um, what's my ID? It can be 10. OK, and if you do this, you see it returns OK, person James 20. OK, it's got the person. It's all correct. So what's going on here? Well, let's let's decompose it by looking at the types. So the type person is of type string to int to int to person. It's, it's a data constructor. Um, and now we're going to f map that to OK, uh, James. And this is exactly what you would expect. So we have this string, this OK string with F map. It returns failure int to int person. And then we just keep on going. We could apply if we like with error. Oh, it's not error anymore. It's fail. And oh, let me get rid of that T. Oh. No instance of show. Ah, it can't show the function. Um, I'll just put the other two in. So you see, if any of them fail, the whole thing fails. That's interesting. You know, it's 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 really handy for that, um, and you can kind of see what the uh, what the infix is doing in this case. Um, it's building up this person inside the context of failure. So really handy, really handy. Um, and now for the big boy, um, we're going to go to monad. So uh, not, we'll look at the class. So class and applicative is a dependency. Um, so Return is of type A to M A, and return has a default definition, which is pure. And then there's a fun one now, and that is um, M A bind. Now, excuse my font; it's those characters without a space. To um, Uh, what am I doing? This is a definition. I need to put it in brackets. So you have this infix here, which takes in a, uh, a monad. Um, it takes a function, which is a to mb, and it returns mb. Now, there are so many things that are encapsulated well by monad. Uh, it's incredible. It's incredible how many things. There are some uh, monadic laws 
that might be good to know. Um, laws like the maths. Um, so for example, um, return x bound to f is the same as return f of x. Um, so that's good. fx bind return equals fx. Um, oh, and then there's the weird one. Um, so f, no, so uh, f bound to g bound to h equals, um, so the brackets go like this, I think. Let me quickly work that one out. Um, so we have xm, so uh, no, they don't. They go like this. Yep, <laughs> apologies. So that is the same as f bound to lambda x gx bound to h. So if you're interested, those are the monad laws. Uh, you can prove them out monads if you like. What tends to happen is you really struggle to define the definition of a monad if it happens not to be a monad. But if you really want to be a top-notch programmer, you'll go ahead and prove that those ty you know, that your monad types adhere to those rules. Um, but anyway, that was a digression. Um, so let's think about a good example. So we can also define, we can say that our failure type is a monad as well. So instance monad failure, um, cool, where, before I forget, um, let me comment out that. So we don't need to define return because it equals pure uh, by default. We just need to define bind. So bind is really great. It's um, okay, x bound to f equals fx and error, no, it's fail now, fail bound to f equals fail. And that's our definition of monad, so, or bind at least. So let's, let's try and work out what this does, um, or at least what we can use it for. It's quite obvious what it does. It does what I wrote it does. Um, so I can chain together functions that have no context, no, no error context in this, but produce an error context. And I can chain these together. And this massively simplifies my programming. Um, so for example, do you remember we did that safe divide function and it involved a huge number of pattern matching cases? Um, let's define it again. Safe divide is of type failure int to failure int to failure int. So safe divide. This time we're going to give it inputs like so. We're not going to bother pattern matching on them. We're going to go xm binds to, and then I'm going to put that in a function. Uh, I'm going to put, I'm going to bind that to a Lambda function. So actually an, an interesting thing to show you would be signed holes. So um, if I just write underscore somewhere in a Haskell program, um, it gives me this error where it says found hole and then it tells you the type of that hole. So int to failure int, interesting. Um, that really helps when you're writing complicated functions like this. So anyway, I'm gonna bind that to um, a lambda. So 
Now what I'm going to do, I'm going to do this on a new line, is I'm going to take ym. In fact, can I, maybe I can make them a line and that would be satisfying. ym, and I'm going to bind that to a lambda as well. So thinking about scope, um, where my cursor is now, I have access to both x and y. Now let's think about what we've done so far. So if xm is a fail, let's look at our definition, the whole thing will fail. It won't bother reading any of that. It's just going to fail. Perfect. But say xm is OK, it's going to move and it's going to bind whatever is it, you know, OK, x is now x. And we can move on. Now, if this has failed, the rest of it's going to fail. But if it's OK, we now have whatever the OK value was in y. And now all I need to do is I need to check to see whether y is uh, 0 or not. So if y equals 0, then fail. Else um, return x div y. Now this is horrible. This, this code is... Mm, Let's align it like this. I don't really know. I've not really thought about the alignment here. Sort of a weird shaped function. Let's see if that's, that's fine. So safe divide. Okay, 10. Okay, five. I get okay, two. Now, if I try and divide by zero, it's gonna fail. And if I try and divide uh, safe divide, OK, 5, bracket that, it's going to fail. Great. And if I change that back, there we go. So it has the functionality we want. Um, fascinating. Fantastic. But that's only one sort of monad, and this is a very simple monad. So this monad that I've described is actually the maybe monad. So in Haskell, there is a type that's like this, and it has a better name than what I was coming up with. Uh, maybe a equals just a or nothing. So that's the type we basically recreated. And that has a functor monad, an applicative um, definition instance already built in. But we can do so much more with monads. There are so many different monads out there. Um, so let's look at some of them. So lists are monads. Um, so say I have the list one, two, three, and I pipe that into a function. Uh, what function should I pipe that into? It has to be a function that takes in an integer and returns a list of something um, in order to fit the definition of bind. Um, so say I had a function that just doubles, doubles, you know, you can see what that does. Um, I then get one, one, two, two, three, three. So what it does is it, the definition of bind on lists is it runs this function on all of them and concatenates the result together. So that, that's an interesting one. Um, what else? Well, there's the big boy, there's IO. So we're going to go over IO later. And um, we're going to sort of derive it from first principles, I think. So next next tutorial, I, I promised I'd do um, uh, GUI stuff. And we will do GUI stuff. Um, after that, I think what I'm going to do is I'm going to um, look at building interpreters. I think we're going to build an interpreter. So I, I'm going to go through... Um, it's very easy in Haskell, you see. So I, I think we're going to do interpreter stuff. Um, and at that point, I'm going to derive this from first principles. And it's a bit of a whoa moment. So um, I'm not going to go into how IO is defined, but IO A is a monad. And so this line, this line, put strulen or print string line is of type um, string to IO 
unit. So unit is just, uh, it's like a placeholder type. It doesn't really do anything. Um, but we can now kind of extend this. So if I bind that to a function that ignores its input and then does something else, put str line hello world, um, then our main function now prints two lines. Hello Haskell, hello world. You know, we're getting somewhere now. Um, so there's sort of a, a shorthand for this. And that is um, if we want to ignore the result of the previous thing in the monad, it's just two greater than signs. Um, so that's one shorthand. Um, there's another interesting shorthand that would make this code a lot clearer. And that is do notation. So you should use do notation as little as humanly possible. Um, but for things where you're binding to lambdas a lot, it is a lifesaver. So do, and this is some extra syntax in Haskell. Um, if I can, do you know what? I'm going to shift this in. What am I doing with my life? Um, if y equals zero, fail, else return x div y. I need a then, and I'm going to new line this for ease on the eyes. So this is actually completely equivalent. It is syntactic sugar for what we did before. So instead of doing all of those nested binds and lambdas and rubbish like that, um, we can kind of, this sort of, it, it extracts the monad, uh, the value in the monad and sticks it in X. And this extracts it from XM and puts it in Y. And, and then you can kind of think of this as sort of almost, it's a bit like imperative programming. Um, but it has the behavior of your monad. So if XM is fail, the rest of it won't be run. This is exactly the same as what we wrote before. Um, so you'll see safe divide still works as expected. Um, but it's very useful for IO. When you do it in IO, it is just like, in a way, imperative programming, but slightly more inconvenient. So if I just put two things one after another, that's the same as joining them with um, the two greater than signs. Um, so main here does exactly what you'd expect. Um, great, so let's let's talk about a bit more input and output. So there's the whole classic, um, oh, what's your name? My name is James. Oh, hello, James. We'll do that. Um, so, Print line, uh, hello, what's your name? Um, and then we'll go in S, um, read line, I think it is. Um, and then we have to replace this with hello plus plus S. Oh. Ah, I wrote a capital by accident. Um, oh, maybe it's Readlin. Let's see. Let's see. So, main, what's your name? James. Oh, what have I done? What have I done? Oh, um, it is read line, but I've I've got it in the wrong import system. Uh, uh, system dot environment maybe? No. Um, oh no, it's get line. Oh, I apologize. I apologize. Let me f 
fix this. Get line. There we go. So main James. Hello James. We call we of course we could have written that using the other syntax. So I could say get line and then I could bind that and go probably to a lambda lambda x x I can do it like that works exactly the same um, and that's IO um, so if I wanted to I could um, cable v2 build it will go and uh, build it and then if I, if I can go cable v2 run hello what's your name James hello James I can do it like that or I can find the executable and run it that way um, yeah we're getting there um, so I alluded by accident to uh, system dot environment um, import oh mind your indentation system dot environment that's going to let us do some more fun things. So um, if I go args, get args, um, that's going to get all the command line arguments that followed the uh, the call of my program. I can then print args. So what print does is print um, takes anything that's showable and you know prints out the show function for it. So um, main does nothing because I gave it no arguments. I could give it hello world. Um, I can run, so what's this called? Tutorial six, um, hello world. I can run it, you know, build it and run it properly. So we're compiling it here and it works in exactly the same way. You know, we're building proper programs now. They're not, they're not useful yet, but they, uh, they're they proper. Um, anything else? There's um, a fun one, if I get back into the REPL, um, called interact. And it takes a string to a string and outputs something of type IO. So if I, if I go, um, so string to string reverses of type string to string. So if I make my function interact reverse, um, and let's build that, let's run it. Um, so we're running it now. If I type hello, um, oh, I thought it would reverse it. Oh, D maybe? Yes. Um, you can see it reversed the input. Um, D is um, D sends an end of file thing to uh, an end of file character, um, control D to the application. So as soon as the application finished, it, um, yeah, I wonder if I go echo hello and pipe that into um, cabal v2 run. There you go, it reverses it. Um, so what I suggest you do is use Google now that you know how to use Monads with IO and you can work out how to read files, write to files, loads of different IO functions. But at this point, you can actually write functional command line applications. And next session, we will work on um, graphical user interfaces. Cool, so that's all for this video.